Hello. Annabelle or, or Diane? One yes, I got it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Annabelle Haudegui, and I'm the administrative assistant for the Department of Multicultural. <laughs> Our, moderate, our moderator today is Dr. Gordon Bronitsky, founder and president of Bronitsky and Associates and Indigenow. He has worked with indigenous peoples around the world in the performing arts and festival development since 1994. We thank him for curating the speaker series. I will let him take it away so he can formally introduce our presenter today, Mrs. Gloria Grant. Just a reminder that you are encouraged to participate and ask questions via chat. Well, thank you very much. I really want to thank Eastern New Mexico University for creating this, this series. And it really is a pleasure for me to introduce Gloria. Gloria Grant is originally from Chinle, Arizona. Her mother was Navajo. Her father was an Omaha Indian from Nebraska. And she comes from a family of progressive thinkers and doers. Her mother was one of the first certified teachers in the Chinle Public Schools. Her father was the founder of the Phoenix Indian Center, the first in the country. She has a master's degree and a little unusual. Gloria and her sisters were the first Native American Indian rodeo trick and fancy rodeo riders. She has a master's of art degree in educational leadership, was a classroom teacher and served as the, as the associate superintendent for assessment for the Chinle Unified Schools. She and her family have traveled the world at the invitation of world indigenous leaders, advocates and activists. And with that, it really is a pleasure to introduce Gloria. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. I want to thank Eastern New Mexico University, the Multicultural Affairs Department, Diana and Annabelle for extending this invitation to me. I wanna thank Gordon because he made this possible too by, um, well, he, asked me to be a speaker on some other occasions and this is where Diana came in. She heard my last presentation. I want you to know I'm so happy to be here. My presentation today is on border town racism and I have my notes here and I'm just gonna every now and then I'll turn and, and read my notes and, and get back with you. And so uh, my name is Gloria. I'm a Twitich Aintney, Bitterwater, born for the Deer Clan of Nebraska. My grandfathers are Kiaani, one of the four major clans of the Navajo, and my, my Nullies are the Wind Clan from Nebraska. And I introduce myself this way to you as an indigenous woman who acknowledges those that came before her and those that will come after me. Um, I'm originally from Chinle. My father, like I said, he was an Omaha Indian from Nebraska who lived with my mother for 66 years in Chinle. Um, my, my father was kind of a different mold of an Indian because the Omahas lived on the banks of the Missouri River. They were gateway Indians to all of the, all of the settlers and Indians that were passing, going to, wet, going to the West. The Omahas were the kind of the keepers of the gate and they were very peaceful people. They defended themselves, but they also experienced racism before a hundred years before the Navajo people. So my father came out to Arizona. Uh, he had a rodeo accident and convalesced and then met my mother at, uh, of all places, the Cook Christian Training School. And then they both enrolled in Phoenix Night School, Phoenix College. So uh, his work like, my, like Gordon mentioned, he founded the first Indian center for Indians that were in the 1950s because of the Eisenhower Act, they, did, they were displaced. And he, he gave a building that had coffee and a phone, one phone, and they could apply for jobs or they could take a break while they hitchhiked back to the reservations. So um, it has flourished. It is one of the, uh, he has an honor of distinction every year of being honored by the city of Phoenix, the Phoenix Indian Center. Um, my father would take us on rodeo trips and vacations across this, not vacations, but rodeo trips and trips. We would just start out and he would say, Your Indians don't really go on vacations. Uh, you, you go and check on the land and enjoy this land because it's yours. Uh, you will find Indians in all these major cities because they were once American Indian watering holes. They were the places where 
when uh, when American Indians were moving around, they would stop at these various places in the Chicago, St. Louis, where the waterways were, and they would rest, they would plant, and then they would move on. They never stayed in one place because of sanitation. So um, he would say, "So claim this land. This land is is not it's not it belongs to you." And and so as a very young girls and young people, we grew up with a different perspective about the Turtle Island. We really did feel like this is our we're the landlords. Um, the uh, I the Navajo people are located in four states. Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado, a little bit in Colorado. And there are um, 200 and, let me think, let me see, there's 27,000 square miles of land and over a population of over 300,000 Navajos. And they um, live there today. I'm from Chinle, the heart of the Navajo Nation. And we have um, 15 grocery stores in, in all of that landscape which is the size of West Virginia. So if you can think about 15 grocery stores that kind of look like Safeway located throughout the reservation, not close, not close together. And um, uh, so it's, it's, it's quite isolated. It still is today, even though we have some businesses, it isn't like you would expect it to be. Um, the, term reservation is not our term. We call ourselves nations. We're nations of people because we have our own constitution. We also have our own language and our own songs and our own prayers. So reservation is an implied term. It's an imposition on our life. We, do, we are the only people in the Turtle Island that live behind barbed wire fences. This concept was taken by some of the uh, nations such as I uh, think Germany used the concept of, of Navajo of the Navajo nation and made it successful with, with their, um, in their history. It was a template and it's a template that was used throughout the world. What was used on us first? So that's, uh, that's, that's a, 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 a government type of, um, of oppression that uh, is a reality to this day. So we live by 300 and say around 340 laws more than the, than the, than the American, or average American. If we leave the reservation, we are to be imprisoned. We'd all be in prison if they, if they really enacted that law. But there's so many laws that are tied to us to keep us keep us quiet, keep us out of sight, out of mind. Um, border towns uh, are parasitical, they're greedy, they're dishonest, they, um, uh, they exist around every Indian nation in the world, in, on the, in the United States. There's border towns everywhere. And <clears throat> the reason is, but trying to implement a, or have a business on, on the Indian nations is, is really hard. You have to go through uh, tribal law, federal law, state law, and then maybe in years to come, you might be able to establish your business. Just really disheartening because it, it does, um, it just, it, it doesn't happen so many times. So these border towns, they just pop up. And uh, like, uh, and I'll go through them, but they um, they provide what we sometimes don't have, you know, gasoline, groceries, um, medical services, the foods that we like, and and of course their anchor is always liquor. Um, these border towns really promote all the oppressions, oppression, depression, and lateral oppression. And lateral oppression to us is the worst kind of intra-racism that exists against our own people. And you know, it, it, it is something that is not new, but it's, it's almost becoming fine-tuned with those that practice that against us, our own people. Um, so other, other businesses that exist are like pawn shops. The best museums in the country are pawn shops. They take our best. We, we pawn things when we need extra money. We give our best and we never see them again because the interest rates are so high, 200%. Dishonest car salespeople, fast cash businesses, um, just, you know, even, even, even stores like, you know, like Walmart, uh, 
uh, they, they exist, Hobby Lobby, and uh, we pour our, our Navajo people, especially pour their money into entities like this and, and get many times, you know, substandard quality material, just really sad. So um, it's hard to not frequent them. We have to frequent them because we don't have them on the reservation. We have some businesses like this and we value them. And it's been extremely hard for them during this COVID time to keep going. One thing most border towns have in common are railways. Rail, the railways that go right by on the outskirts of the towns of each of the reservations to uh, transport coal, water, um, logging, uh, logs, um, other materials that uranium was the first, had the first railroad stations in most Indian nations were used to take uranium out of the, out of the, our land. And they would leave them open pits. <clears throat> um, Next came the interstates right by our reservations, the big trucks and the, and the waterways, waterways on the Great Lakes uh, region, waterways by the rivers where American Indians, you know, that was their transportation. Airways, uh, they needed certain types of land and field and sometimes we had it. So what this did was it promoted uh, really negative things such as, um, the murdered and missing Indian women and men, um, kidnapped kidnapped children and women to this day. And I know Gordon is going to be promoting or pre having someone present on that. And already daughter, did. They already did. My daughter-in-law is on that, serves on, uh, as it works for that uh, group and her, her sister it was a victim in Gallup. And after seven years, it never got into court. So um, I want you to think back about your high school years and your education before. And if you've heard or experienced any of these thoughts or experiences of what that is webinars on. on Indian nations with, with, with uh, Indian people being murdered or Indian people being missing. Um, this brings me to a book that I read uh, many times and then finally I just think I might have thrown it away. It was that Laughing Boy by Oliver Lafarge was first written in 1930 and was a Pulitzer Prize. I think in 1938 romanticizes about a young Indian man, very traditional on the Navajo Nation. He was the epitome of a, mm -hmm. oh, you know, a, a wonderful, handsome, knowledgeable young Navajo man that crossed paths within a beautiful Indian woman in the, it, it's, the town sounds like Winslow. And she was decked out in the best jewelry and she was vivacious and she fell in love with him and she married him. And his family, of course, they didn't know about her, know who is, who are her people? What, who does, she, where is she from? And they cautioned him and cautioned him, but you know, he fell in love with her. And then on weekends she'd disappear Oh, one weekend he has to go into Winslow and he finds that she's partying with railroad workers and disappeared into a room. And um, he, he, he was so heartbroken. So he went home and she came back and they had argument and everything. And he, she was a prostitute. And that's what she did on the weekends with the railroad workers. So this book, even though we used it as high school reading material in, on the reservations, it, it was what it did was it, it, it um, promoted uh, stereotypical images of, of what our women probably are really like. Oh, they're just prostitutes. They'll do anything for money. Give them chocolate. And um, they banned this book, the American Indian uh, a, 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 liter a literature group, and then they put it into schools and said, don't give this book out to, to our Indian children to read. It's, it's negative and we don't want it anymore on the shelf. So Laughing Boy has come back. Think about those books that kind of promoted cartoonish, funny, romanticized, dehumanizing images of American Indians. That promotes, that's, that's systemic racism in school. Um, so just think about that sometime that, you know, what were some of those images that you saw about us being not real, uh, cartoonish, 
funny, pot-bellied, you know, and just that existed. It even was it it even existed in our systems. So what is racism? Racism is to be prejudged, usually by a dominant society, mm -hmm. in this case by white America. Um, it's very structure, structural, it's oppressive, um, it's white privilege, it's white preferential treatment. Um, it's it, it structural racism is is the gateway of all the isms of racism. And I, I read this a little uh, paper, on, it's not little, but I read a good pa paper on race and public policy by uh, Keith Lawrence and Terry Callagher from um, Berkeley in 2004. And they used those terms, structural, systemic, it was kind of introduced at that time. The other day I was listening on TV and there was a, a very prominent like, black politician and he said, uh, systemic racism doesn't exist anymore. And I stopped in my tracks and I thought, I gotta hear this. So what he says is, and this is food for thought, and, and since we're all in education and educators, we always need to be open to new learning like this. It, like, uh, it, systemic means it's practiced. It's practiced in housing, in education, in health, um, in, uh, in, what else? In almost all walks of life we have we have this practiced racism. Well, he says that doesn't exist anymore because it, it, it's no longer practiced. It's become a way of life here in America. And you think about what we've been going through with the last year and politics and you know, black men, black lives, murdered and missing Indian women, you know, this systemic racism is, is out of sight, out of mind. Um, the overt and covert acts of racism are, 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 that's lumping them into two areas that I, I know about too. That overt racism is you go into a store, you, they don't want you there. They let you know it. They're not going to serve you. They have a sign out, but no Indians are dogs allowed. You go in anyway. Yep. They don't want you there. Covert is covered. They know you're there, but they ignore you. They just want you to go away. They don't care if your dollar is green. So, you know, the, we as American Indians, I speak as American Indian woman because I know of this as that. I can't speak for everybody, but I do know that, you know, we do, we, this, this even happens in the border towns. Can you imagine they, they, um, they want our money, but they don't like us. So, I, um, you, I want you to think about, remember a time when you may have witnessed unjust, an unjust inequality, in, unjust inequality, marginal mistreatment of a person of color. And what did you do about it? What should we do about it? So I'm gonna tie the two, border town racism. I provided a definition for you. It's the enforcement systems of power colonization of money, of the injustice systems that exist. It's white supremacy, it's an oppressive nature. It has diffused our history in historical, historical accounts. We do not exist in children in the history. Um, it's forced removals from our land to walk thousands and mil just hundreds of miles at the, uh, you know, soldiers, uh, you know, they've, uh, they make us march to Fort Sumner. They did the long walk, uh, the trail of tears, march people back and forth just to show that they could do this to us and remove us from our lands. It's the massacres of a wounded knee. Uh, it's the eradication through smallpox and measles blankets. It's the killing of our chiefs. It's the almost near complete eradication of our men in spirit. And, you know, it was like that the, the government, when they came after us, they didn't leave anything unthought of. You know, they get, get our men, kill our chiefs and uh, remove us. So to this day, they haven't been very successful. We're still here even though we're on behind the barbed wire fences with our laws, 
they're at, they are on lands we love that we know will protect them, but we still know about why we're there and what the history is. I have a, some examples of five border towns. I would like to share some information with you. Um, I'm not giving a lot of statistics. I could, I could bombard you with statistics, but I think that is something that we can, uh, you know, if I present sometime again, I might be able to put a table up, but I want to just kind of dialogue with you about it. I mean, this way. Gallup, New Mexico has one of the longest histories of police brutality about border, border town. No. Race. There would be a separate line. Is someone's refunds are that we have would be a hello? Hello? Hi, Gloria. Um, I think somebody accidentally unmuted, but I went ahead and muted them so you can continue. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, so let me start with I can, I, we can go a farther back on, on, but, on Gallup, but. One of the things I do want to mention is the killing of Larry Casus uh, in 1973, a young student at the university, like, at the university, okay, just let me know. Hello? Going. Okay. I can't hear anybody. The killing of Larry Casus, who was a University of New Mexico student who fought against the city of Gallup almost primarily by himself. Simultaneously, the, the battle, the wounded knee and the wounded knee massacre, the wounded knee standoff was happening. And I always wish that uh, one of them could have waited for the other as they could have gotten some help. But Larry Casus went up against Gallup merchants, went up against the mayor of Gallup for owning the most notorious bar situated right outside of Gallup, New Mexico. The bar was named the Navajo Inn. And it was right on, right as you leave the border town, there's the bar. There were many murders of families killing each other, people getting hit on the highway and they kept selling the booze. And Larry went up against the mayor who owned that bar. He owned uh, most of the bars in, in Gallup and protested against him. And uh, so he decided he was gonna do a citizen's arrest. And one day he took it upon himself to do that. And the police, they shot Larry. They killed him numerous times. And, and then they put him in the store window of a Gallup um, shop to display. And um, that's documented. So Gallup um, loved their liquor and the money they made from it. And uh, they were not gonna stop at anything. Gallup to me is a, the best example of the worst example. It's, their government is incestuous. So it's their police and their judicial department. Um, nothing has come out of murdered and missing Indian women in Gallup, New Mexico. And I'm gonna just say that because it is true. Alcohol is their number one sales to Navajo. It's very profit making. Um, the mayor owned not only the bars, but he owned the treatment center too. Um, so it's known for all, a lot of slick scams, car scams, uh, loan scams, um, you know, just really bad. Slick, they jack up their prices on everything. So many times people will come all the way to Albuquerque to get you know, a good price on something or go all the way to Phoenix. It's almost worth going to the, the bigger city, spend that margin of money and go get something that's not jacked up 200% in Gallup, New Mexico. I think that Gallup still has that um, mentality. I don't think it's changed much. I see, I see where there is demarcations and lines of, uh, this is where Indians shop and this is where you're where you don't go and we all know that we all know where we're welcomed where we're served uh, in restaurants with fairness uh, and those that we will we will not venture into because we know that we're not welcome there there's more about Gallup uh, this is just I'm trying to get through this in Winslow Winslow Arizona was once referred to as an armpit town 
Um, and um, people from Winslow just, I, I have relatives, they don't like that. But they also, like Gallup, have a railway that goes right through town. Uh, Gallup has a big railroad station and the interstate, and so does Winslow. Not long ago, um, in 2008, there was a, a, a killing by a police officer on a young girl that was uh, reported by a 7-Eleven owner that there's a young girl acting weird outside and you, you need to come take a look at it, take a look at her. And so when the police got there, they, they said they, they called to her and she was brandishing scissors at them, but that's not what they found on her. And the, they, they, the, the police killed her, they shot her. So um, very little came out of that. And there, um, uh, the, the Maricopa County Atter Attorney of Office of Attorney General said there was not enough evidence to move on this and, and uh, that couldn't be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. So the officer still is today moving around Winslow and this young girl who didn't have any weapons on her was, was murdered. And it was told that the, the um, white people in Winslow on the weekends, they know of incidences where they let their children go out and beat up and abuse Indians on the, on the streets. They, they, they hurt them and they know about it, but they won't tell about it. Uh, which brings me to um, Farmington, New Mexico and uh, referred to as the Sal Al Salma, Alabama of the West. And it has a long and notorious history of racism and extreme violence against Navajos, especially. And Farmington is an oil town. It's based and founded on oil and it has kind of really cl clear class systems. There's, there's kind of like the lower class white people and then there's a the big middle class and then there's the upper. And they kind of, they don't really, um, it sounds to me when I read the research, it doesn't sound like they, they, they talk much, but they agree on one thing and that's they hate Navajos. And in uh, 1975, um, a civil right, the Civil Rights Commission conducted an investigation on murders that were done on Indian men. A lot of Indian men were castrated, decapitated, dragged to death, um, tortured. And they found that there were two young men that they, they really, that they were doing this. And um, so once they were prosecuted, they went to Boys Town. They did not go to prison. They were only there for a couple of years, a slap on the wrist. So what I find in towns like this is that you have police departments that lack credibility. They don't complete investigations. They don't complete their reports. And it's really hard and, and worse when it's a Navajo. So when you go and you want to find out more about the investigation, it's going to be incomplete and it's never going to be finished. And that's really a sad statement, even in this day and age. So that's the type of extreme racism that um, exists in some of these towns. There is a book called Broken Circle by Rodney Barker. And I know that uh, Gordon uh, said, don't forget to talk about you know, Broken Circle because it's about this town. It's about these atrocities. So if you can get a hold of that book. And at the end, I'm going to suggest some reading. Um, this is a, I guess, Farmington has one of the best examples of cultural racism. And it's, I don't like you just because the way you look. I don't like you because of your skin color and I don't like you because you're Navajo. Cultural racism, it doesn't even have to be, you know, um, I don't like you because you live in that, in, in low rent housing. It's, I just, I don't care where you live, I don't like you. So um, Farmington is one town that uh, if I don't have to go through there and if I don't have to go to Lauderburger and buy some, buy a burger in Farmington, I won't. I'll go to Shiprock, I'll come home. Um, I just, uh, I'm not afraid of them. I just don't wanna participate in their economy. And we are the lifeline to these border towns. We supply them. They wouldn't live without us. If we stopped and, 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 and stopped the uh, business with them, we'd hurt many merchants. Um, so we go to Flagstaff, which is a redneck logger town based on logging. And um, 
it also has a structural uh, system with distinct wealth demark with systems. And um, the, there's the townies, and then there's this, those pesty NAU students to, uh, what about those Navajos, Ugh, you know, and the Babbitts who run everything. So um, it, it's not really a very safe town for us. I was just talking about this the other day about, oh, I feel so glad that people seem a little happier with what happened the other day with the results of, the, of candidacies. And they just seem a little lifted. And somebody wrote to me and they said, not in Flagstaff. We went there, we were treated terrible. So it doesn't matter it, what, the, what, the, what the climate might be like in the outside world where people are a little, maybe a little bit happier and see, see change they still don't want to see you happy and they don't want, they're gonna make you unhappy or you know, they're, they're going to oppress you. I mean, you have to take it in. We can't take it in, that's up to us. So Flagstaff makes its money on, on logging and tourism and the NAU campus is here. I don't see much interaction ever between campus and town, not really, except for the bars. Um, they used to have a, an event called the Flagstaff Indian Powwow where I mean, Indians from all over came and they, they had this great time. We rodeoed there. There was the carnival and there was activities and lots of different tribes would come in. And, and it just seemed like half of them were in jail. And then when they were, when the town jails filled up, they transferred them out. Then they built their own quick jail right there on the, where the rodeo grounds is. And it would be filled to capacity with Indians there, but they would still get their money. Um, a lot of our border towns are like this. They promote things that they say, oh, it's um, for, uh, come see the Indians and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna put them in a parade and you, you can buy jewelry from them, but they're hoping to sustain their business and their liquor business. So um, I, um, and named about what, five towns. And then there's of course Page, Arizona where the remark was made by the lawyer that, I mean, the mayor to uh, our president. I wish you'd take just as much interest in uh, your alcoholic Navajos as you do in COVID. And he had to apologize for that, that the president of our nation demanded it. We have workers there that work in the plant. We have many Navajos that live there. We have a state and federal budget that supports their public school programs. So sometimes I think people just, you know, they, they, they just wanna make it known where they stand and, and many times they don't care what they say. Um, I'm going to skip down to uh, some of the racist cities that we deal with that I know of, the super racist cities. Um, so the Steelers of these are the interpretation of, of uh, like we say, Bill of Ghana. That means those that come to fight us. And then the Lakotas, they call them Washichu. And Washichu means Steelers of the fat. They come and they get the best part of the meat and they leave the rest. So the stealers of the fat cities are um, Rapid City, not until recently, we could see signs there that said no Indians are dogs allowed. Tulsa, Oklahoma, the same. Great Falls, Montana. Billings, Montana. Salt Lake City, Utah. Denver, Colorado. Bismarck, North Dakota and Phoenix, Arizona. So it's it's knowledge a knowledge among among us as native people we know these things we know which cities are like this we know which towns it's something that we had to grow up with and become and confront yes we know it and no we will not go there and yes we will go through. sometimes when indians come to the navajo nation fair the lakotas they would leave there um, at night and travel in and get here in the morning. When they yeah, left, about ten minutes, Gloria. They, they left at night only to, and they knew all the back roads, so they wouldn't chance it with the cops. Just, Indians don't have a chance. My sons, I was married to the late Russell Means for five, 15 to sixteen years. I have two sons for for Russell. 
uh, Tatanka means and Natani means, and this is their life work. And I'm always telling them, take heed, be careful, you know, watch your back. And they, but they grew up like this. And so they know about traveling and, you know, how to be careful. They don't travel at night. They, they travel regular, like on airplanes are in their own cars, but do want them to be careful. Um, what, what is it that we can, we can do with facing inequality, injustice systems, racism, are the historical lies about us. We, we need to be involved. Uh, we don't want to sometimes in the political landscape. We need to be able to push legislation. We need to have policy in place. And if it's in place, why isn't it being addressed? This is, this is where we need to go on the, with, our, with our nations and, if, and at the state level. And right now it's a very good time. So plan forward, what should we do? Be involved with groups, with the church groups, looking at the, what the, the doctrine of discovery. They're all looking at that now. Be a, uh, aware of platforms and discussions. And I like New Mexico because they really get involved. They get right out there. I just love it. Um, know what your school curricula is, is uh, touting. Um, be involved with legislation, what's happening at the state level and help to support, help to support them. Planning forward, we need to have hope. We need to be present at the table. We need to participate. We're human beings, all of us, we all bleed red. We need to have, we need to be reasonable. We need to reason. That's the power we have as human beings. That separates us besides our thumb, we can reason. We need to educate, and we're in a good place of that right now with Eastern New Mexico University. We need to be politically involved, get involved if it makes for change. We need to exhibit gracious acts of kindness. So in closing, um, I'm going to read some books to you, not read some books to you. Yes, for, for seven days. And, uh, I'm just some titles and then I will send them to Gordon and he can send them on. But uh, I do, I do recommend you read Laughing Boy by Oliver Lafarge, just to know like what I'm talking about. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown. In the Spirit of Crazy Horse by Peter Matheson. Where White Men Fear to Tread by Russell Means. The Killing of the Flower Moon by David Gran. Fool's Crow by Thomas Males. Cry Sacred Ground by Anita Parlo. The Osage, and I'm sorry, that was a, the Osage is a, it's, it's a document and I don't, so it doesn't, you know, it kind of comes across different. My son suggested at lunch to me a book called, Big, what is it? Big, Hor Big Horse, The Warrior? Mm -hmm. Big Horse, The Warrior. So a lot of times we read books and we suggest them to one another. My sons read, they're avid reader, readers. They read books. Mom, have you read this? No, I, you better read it. So what it does is it validates. We're not just telling you this to make you feel sorry for us. We want to do something about it. We have generations to come. We're responsible to the generations that left. Okay, so should I take some questions? Gordon. Okay, uh, several people have asked about uh, the books you recommended. So what I'll do when you send them to me, I will send them to Diana and she can, because she has the contact information for everyone. So, and I do recommend the books she recommended. They're excellent. So that's, that's certainly something to think about. Let's see what other questions there are. Um, uh, ba -dum -ba -dum. Somebody asked, um, Olga Gould asked, uh, would it be possible for me to attend some outdoor event, festival, or gathering of the Native American people? I want to talk to people really face to face. And I suggested to her that everything is closed right now, but what would you recommend? Well, I recommend that, it, you know, symposiums like this that is that are being uh, 
uh, platformed by the different universities because uh, it, it, they do, they do exist. Also, if you get online and just kind of peruse it, there, there, all the Indian nations uh, have links to uh, chats or, or information that they're sharing. Um, so, you know, I, you could find most anything. If you go to say the Navajo Nation and the webpage comes up, you know, something will come up or maybe something in legislation or people that are talking about an issue that you, you would be able to link on, such as with my, uh, my cousin Zani Gorman, she does a, a wonderful presentation on the Navajo co-talkers, Carl and Mary Gorman, or their daughter is Zani. Um, she, Zani Gorman, and you could go to co-talkers, Navajo co-talkers, and you, her link will come up. You can also go to Klee Benali, K-L-E-E -E, Benali, who I really support because of his efforts of working in Flagstaff. You know, uh, he works so hard against racism every day and the homeless and snowball being watered by the sewer system. It's that's our sacred mountain. So you could go to, um, oh gosh, I would say, you know, Klee Benali and his, his website will come. They link to many others. They, they it, it'll just keep you going. But American Indian uh, topics and symposiums, you might be able just to Google that okay. and try to find one. And here's another question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Here's a question from Shantie Fulgham. In all the cities you listed a moment ago, are they still against natives or was that a while ago? They're still, ex that exists to this day. They are still um, uh, murdering Indians. Uh, they, they are in jail for, I mean, unjust amount of times. They do not have representation. No, we we have uh, racism in the police departments is rampant, and they hurt our people, and they and even the townspeople they can tell lies, and the police will just come and get them. There's no, there's no there's no here. I mean, the system is there. It's like a kangaroo court. It it still exists, and um, we have to we have to know, we have to inform one another. If, if you make one phone call in Denver, be sure to make it to Glenn Morris or somebody like that. You know, you need to know who to contact so they know you're, you're in jail because it's scary. If you don't know people or you can't get a hold of somebody, you don't know how long you're gonna be there. Okay. It exists. Here's an observation from Michelle Ben. She says, it's not a question, but to further your point, I'm from Gallup, and when our city locked down for a week due to COVID, it was a ghost town. Without the Navajo community, this town's economy would be terrible. Thank you for adding yeah. that. Thank you. It, we were like, oh, and, and it was, there was so much peace on the reservation. It was just, my sister said that if she could just feel the peace of, uh, you know, it being quiet and not crazy and we could shut these border towns down if if we really made an effort to not go and shop there. And um, Gallup would be the first to come to its knees. Here's an observation from Jereen Yazi. I'm from Sheep Springs, New Mexico, and have to travel to border towns consistently for my grandparents and have experienced a number of accounts with individuals in Farmington. It is very sad to see. It is. Speak up, though. You know, tell them. You know, we're we're. Um, I'll, you can speak up if they're if they're if they're being hurtful to your elders. Uh, just say you. Be careful. Be aware of your surroundings. You yeah. Natani just said, be careful of your surroundings and be careful of and watchful of where you're always at. But you can report them. You write to the president of the Navajo Nation. Let the Better Business Bureau, of, for what it's worth, the Better Business Bureau of Farmington, take a picture, record it, say, um, tell them, I don't like, speak up. I don't like the way you're mistreating my grandma and grandpa. And uh, what, what can they say? And, and be sure not to frequent there anymore. It's really hard with your grandparents because my dad would go to business places and they treated him and Gallup like, oh, I mean, yay, Mr. Grant. And then it weren't always like that to other people. So sometimes I would see that in my family 
but he knew it existed and he'd be the first to call. call. Here's a follow here's a follow up from Julissa Duffy Marquez. As a Gallup, New Mexico native and Navajo woman, I've spent most of my own life battling lateral oppression and violence. What are some tools you could recommend to help with this issue? Thank you. Well, lateral oppression is really, it's almost, it's so insidious. I would, I would speak up. If it's in a business, I would tell, I would speak to a manager and say, I don't like this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to let others know. I'm going to go, I'm going to the press. I'm going to put this on social media about how I was mistreated by my own people. You can do some threatening things like that and it might stop, it might change, it might not. But lateral oppression is the worst type. Intra-racism is not, is what we don't want to promote. And we need to call it and say, you know, you're part of the problem. You need to change your, you need to change your thinking about what you're doing to people through lateral oppression because they don't know what the they don't know what it is sometimes they just know they have to act this way to keep their job okay here's another question from Jareen Yazzie. what are your thoughts on the incorporation of native american history into the education system i graduated in 2015 from shiprock high and did not learn about my own historical background I developed with uh, about 13 indigenous native people, most of them medicine men and herbalists, a whole unit of cu cultural curriculum in Chinle School District. None of, it, it, nothing like it ever. Superintendents would come in and make their own initiatives to follow state initiatives and, to, and, and just said, you have to just give that to culture teachers. They teach that where the research was so amazing, it outdid uh, public school information, you know, unite, this, this, the dumb stuff that dead kids learn that don't, it's meaningless. My son's tuned out. They yelled at me. Why aren't we learning this? Why are we, you know, because the school boards have to say, this is a priority. This is what the students need to know. And the superintendents need to say, I am for this. We had one superintendent that did that and then he passed away. So you have to have everybody involved, the parents, the community, they supported this until we had changes of superintendents and school boards. No, we don't, parents should teach that, not the school, that's not our responsibility. And I say BS to that. <laughs> I worked with Indian gangs in, from the state of Arizona, part from New Mexico with California, uh, California gangs, two of them. And those the California gangs would come out for, uh, they'd sleep outside and look at the stars and get afraid. And they say, it's too quiet. We've never seen the stars. Our children would say, we don't, why, tell us why we should be proud to be Navajo. I wanna be anything but Navajo, they would tell us. That was a knife in my heart. Cultural curriculum is the, is the standard, is the flagship that we need to live with and put out there for our students to learn. It's a need, it is not an afterthought. It's who we are. I, I really get, you know, but. Here's, here's another question from Chantier Fulgham. As an, as an ally, how can I show support for native people that I could be a safe place for everyone? That you could be a safe place? Yeah, how could she be a safe place? How can she be an ally? Okay, I think that, you know, there are, um, you know, even though we kick against churches, they get the word out. I'm a member of the Presbyterian Church and they have a great committee and community of outreach to people that help one another. So you can't go wrong. And I would, I would say that in this time of discussion with the, um, with the doctrine of discovery, it's on every, it's in communities. They have links with the, at all of these churches, Catholics, Presbyterian. I don't know about the, Pres the Baptist, but I know the Presbyterian and the Catholic churches of New Mexico are really talking about, and they have groups everywhere. Laguna, uh, Santa Fe. Albuquerque, but I would look on, you might want to Google that on the Doctrine of Discovery Santa Fe and see if they link up to people that could, you could 
be with as a support group, uh, I would do something like that. It's a great thought. Yeah. Here's a question from Brian Pasco. You mentioned abandoned uranium mines. They're a large health and safety problem on the Navajo Nation. Is this a priority for the nation's governing body? If not, what can be done? I think it's a priority. It's a priority that is not always um, really like on the cutting edge of, of a daily type of thing. It used to be in the 1970s, the group in Crown Point really went to task on their uh, uranium droppings, uranium fillings that were in their drinking water. And they are, they are uh, battling the after effects right now, but it's prevalent throughout the Navajo Nation where there's open pits left. They have enacted, I think, uh, legislation into the tribe that there's monies now where they're removing it and they're, co they're, they're doing something to dispose. But we've had thousands of Navajo men and families that were affected by their uranium tailings in, in a very sad way whole communities that look like ghost towns. North of Tuba City is um, a town that just looks like a ghost town in it because everybody in it, they either were affected, died, or they had to move because they were, because of the uranium tailings in drinking water, Crown Point, New Mexico. Here's a follow-up from Jereen Yazzie. Even then we will not be portrayed based on our historical events, but more for negative events and pit pitfalls. I was also raised in the Native American church and I'm glad I learned from my own family of my traditions. That's the way to go. That's, our, that's how we have to teach our children. We have to teach them about who we are. I come from a father that was not afraid to stand up in a restaurant in Phoenix and tell the whole restaurant. We were here first in this restaurant and you served them before us <laughs> and we're not leaving. And they would just, they didn't know how to react to them. So we'd get served. And, um, they, and we had really good service. And, and then they were just probably hoping we'd never come back. He was not afraid to confront people. He kind of welcomed it, you know, because he was a big man and he knew what to say. He was eloquent, I was married to a man that was his life. Confront them, don't be afraid, but raise your children knowing who they are. You have to know who you are. It, it, you know, know who you are, know who you came from, know that seventh generation line. And what do you want your children to become? And know you're not a cartoon character. You're not an afterthought. You weren't born and, and, and brought into this world behind barbed wire fences. You were a free people. You gave, you gave food, you gave medicine, you gave transportation, you gave land, you gave water. You gave that to people that didn't have anything. You have to tell children how it is for them to say, hmm, okay. Here's an, observ here's an, an observation from somebody you may know named Joy Manis. This is not a question. We have much work to do in the area of writing history. We are looking for the truth. I have to say that it's my sister's fault probably that I married Russell Means because oh. um, yeah, blame her. I went to, we went to college and we were sitting in our dorm room one day and she was reading Aquasasi notes, that old first Indian newspaper. Oh, yeah. And she said, Oh my God, what are we doing here? We got to go to wounded knee. We didn't have any money. I think we had a beat up truck. We were, we were in rodeo business. We didn't do this, but she opened my eyes and one of the things that she said in high school or college was, where are we in the history books? Where are we? It's like we never existed. We need to write our own history books. We need that. We need to do that. We need, I made a timeline, a beautiful timeline with some teachers at Chen Li, and it really showed and lined up all the acts of, 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 the, of the United States and of the Navajo people, and then uh, national nations across our country. What was happening? Ah, oh, man, the worst thing, Civil War, you know, Lewis and Clark expedition. We have to tell them to get it straight. Otherwise, they'll never, never know. And you don't want your children not to know. They have to know because they have to stand on their own two feet in this world, no matter where they're at, go out, Stand outside, know what the plant life is, their relatives, 
Look up at the stars, know the constellation. You're never alone. You will never be alone. You have to tell your children because you know these things. That's, that's critical. We have time for two more questions. The first one is from M. Baltus. Do you feel the elected leaders of the Navajo Nation represent the people? Uh, I, well, I'm going to say no, <laughs> because I come from a line of thinking that government leaders don't ever represent us, and we're held by too many purse strings from the federal government, mm. and we have to dance to that, and we have to bend and bow, and that's really hard. So sometimes our issues don't get out there, but sometimes you can line up with COVID and the president or COVID and somebody out there and, 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 they, and, and those things might click into place, but there's bigger okay. issues. And sometimes the, the leaders of this country, they don't, it's, it's the blinders out of sight, out of mind. Here, you have your money and your reservation, just handle that. Don't get into the landscape of our political, uh, talks and, and initiatives. It's very hard, I think, for our leaders to 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 play that game. You know, I I, I just really think that they are any uh, they're to be commended for trying, but they but they're not meeting the need. They're okay. not meeting the need. No. Here's the final question from Ian Middleton. The Navajo Nation was successful at stopping the building of the Grand Canyon Escalade and the expansion of the city of Tusayan. How were they so successful in these instances and what can we learn from their activism? I like that question because I, I, need, to, I need to learn about that. Um, I do know the Havasupai, the Wallapai really got involved in that initiative. They must have some really good representation out there because we've been fighting for Snowball for a long, long time. And uh, what, what white America hates to hear from us anymore is this is a sacred site. It means this to us. They don't get it, and uh, and they never will because it it's 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 not meaningful to them. So I have to say that this must their initiative must. That's something they should really talk about and really tout. And I need to know about. And I'm going to find out. And I'm I want to thank you for asking me that question. I'm going to find out why they were successful and what made what made it happen. Thank you. Okay, I think that brings us just about to three. Annabelle, if you'd like to uh, wind it up and talk about our next speaker, Annabelle. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us today and a special thanks to Dr. Bronitsky and Mrs. Grant for that incredible presentation and all that useful information. <laughs> everybody, please don't forget to register for our next event during, his, during Native American Heritage Month on Tuesday, November 17th at 2 p.m. And the presentation is gonna be on Fashion Talk with Navajo fashion designer, Virginia Ballinger. <laughs> be on the lookout in your emails for the registration link. And Can I, in closing, just say th thank you so much, Diane and Annabelle. Thank you for communicating with me. And thank you for asking me to be a part of your month. And I don't go around thinking like this all the time. I'm not always a border town racist. I love life and I, I enjoy it. And I work really well with people. But I also think we have to keep an open mind about how we're educating one another and what are the, what are the benefits. And, and your platform is is a real benefit it's good we need to educate in this way it's enlightening old stuff but it could be good learning thank you thank you all for your questions gloria i attended this is my second presentation with you and it's you just i just absorb every time more and more and more so you're a delight Thank you. Thank we you. Really applaud Thank you. you. Thank you, Diana. Thank, Thank you, Diana. everybody, for attending. We look forward to seeing everybody. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Thank everybody. you, Gordon. Till the next time. Bye bye.